For those of you who just joined, good morning. We're just gonna give everyone a couple more minutes to log in and then we'll get started. Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. Good morning. Thank you for being here today. My name is Lisa Toys, Sustainability Coordinator at the School District of Palm Beach County. This Water Wednesday's student webinar series is in support of Museum on Main Street, a traveling museum exhibition from the Smithsonian. The Museum on Main Street exhibit called Waterways is currently on display at Dolly Hand Cultural Arts Center in Belle Glade, Florida until February 26th. The exhibit is free to visit and was made possible by a grant from Florida Humanities with funds from the National Endowment for Humanities. For information about the exhibit at Dolly Hand, you can visit palmbeachschools.org slash waterways. And if you are not local to Florida or Palm Beach County, you can visit the Smithsonian Institution's website to see if there's a museum on Main Street exhibit touring in a town near you. I'd like to thank our partner on this webinar series, Thompson Earth Systems Institute's Scientists in Every Florida School Program. Florida teachers can request a scientist like today's expert anytime. This session will be recorded and available for future use. Last session, we had some really great questions for our speakers, so please feel free to ask your questions in the chat box, and we will save time at the end to answer them. And now I'd like to, you to join me in welcoming our guest speaker to today, Xenia Alonso. Xenia is originally from Argentina. There she got her bachelor's degree in biodiversity and worked studying aquatic vegetation in wetlands. After Xenia graduated, she came to the United States. She studied English for a few years. And right now she is studying and working at Florida Gulf Coast University in Fort Myers, Florida. She is currently doing a master's degree in environmental science and is working with algae communities in South Florida wetlands. And today her presentation is called Small But Mighty, The Role of Microorganisms in the Everglades. And with that, I will let Xenia take over. Thank you for joining us, Xenia. Thank you, Lisa. I'm gonna share my screen with you, let's see. There, can you see that? Yes. Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Really excited to be here uh, today to talk a little bit about aquatic microorganisms in the Everglades as Lisa told you already. So let's get started. Uh, when we see these kind of landscapes like the Everglades, we often think of big animals like alligators, birds, fish, maybe some plants. But we often forget that part of the foundation of these ecosystems are organisms that we cannot actually see with our naked eye. And there are some important microorganisms in the Everglades, and we're gonna talk a little bit about them. So, in the Everglades, there are aquatic microorganisms that form a um, community. Uh, and they stick one next to each other. And this community has a really cool name. It's called periphyton. Now, peri means around, 
amphetamine plan. So these organisms are usually attached to the roots of the aquatic plants, uh, but we can also find them attached to other surfaces like rocks. We can find them over the sediments at the bottoms of the wetlands, and we can also see them floating around as mats. All these uh, kind of sticks <laughs> that floating in the water, they are actually uh, microorganisms all stick together, one next to the other, forming these mats. Uh, now, these mats are really important in the ecosystem. They're the foundation. Now we're gonna see uh, why is that, but first let's see what's inside of them. So if we grab uh, one of those floating mats, we're gonna see this structure like looks kind of a, like a sponge. Uh, it can be brownish, a little bit of green. And if we put that under the microscope, we can see different types of organisms living there. Uh, we can see algae, like this green one over here. We can also find bacteria and even fungi. Now, one of the roles of these microorganisms is that they provide food for other animals in the system. For example, we can see here uh, some snails that are grazing on the purified on, on top of a log. Uh, and if we see this diagram here, we can see those purified on mats floating around or attached to the vegetation. These mats are eaten by, by small organisms like snails or insects. Then these insects uh, can be eaten by a fish. Then a larger fish can eat the small fish. And then let's say an alligator eat that bigger fish. So we can see that these periphyton mats are at the bottom of the food chain. They are providing food for all uh, the entire ecosystem. Another important role of these uh, organisms is that they provide the house for other animals. Uh, for example, some larvae, some small insects can live between these mats uh, where they find refuge uh, from the predators. So they provide not only food for them, but also a place to live in. Another important characteristic of periphyton is that they are adapted to the dry season. So when we don't have a lot of rain in Florida in the dry season, uh, these periphyton mats that are like sponges can absorb all the water and retain that water in their system. So other animals can access to that water even though the rest of the system is dried out. And lastly, a really important characteristic of these microorganisms is that they regulate the water quality of the system. Some of the organisms in the periphyton, that, like the algae that we see, uh, produce oxygen. And this oxygen uh, is needed for other organisms to breathe. So they are a source of oxygen, constant source of oxygen uh, for the water. They also have the ability to absorb nutrients and absorb uh, contaminants. So actually, when we see water bodies with periphyton, this water is actually pretty uh, clean because this periphyton have this ability to store in their body these contaminants. So they provide good water quality to the system. Now, I'm gonna show you some maps that maybe you already seen. Um, this is how the flow of water used to be in South Florida. Water used to flow from the Kissimmee River to the Lake Okeechobee, all down to the Everglades. Now, then we started growing our crops and developing our cities. So the flow of water was changed uh, 
now we have uh, more water coming from Lake Okeechobee into the west and the east coast and less water coming down to um, the Everglades. Now, another problem is that this water that is still coming to the Everglades is passing through all these agricultural fields and urban areas. So there, that water is loaded with pollutants, especially with nutrients from the agriculture fields. So the water that we are delivering to the Everglades is not as good as it should be for the system. Now, the Everglades have this characteristic that they are uh, ecosystem with low nutrients and the plants and animals that live there are adapted to that. Uh, in this ecosystem, we can find like in this picture on the left, uh, periphyton mats, large fish, floating plants, a lot of birds. But once we started uh, sending water with a lot of nutrients, this kind of ecosystem couldn't uh, tolerate it. And then there was a change, a shift in the communities. Uh, now we see a more uh, dense vegetation like, like cattail, this plant over here. We see less periphyto mats, less floating plants, uh, plants and smaller fish. So right now, there are a lot of different projects uh, that are trying to restore that flow of water back down to the Everglades and also restore the water quality of that water. Now, one of those projects are the stormwater treatment areas that are managed by the South Florida Water Management District and they're right here down Lake Okeechobee, south uh, the Everglades agricultural area. And what are these? These are essentially constructed wetlands. They look like these, like square ponds. <laughs> and this is where we are working right now uh, with, the, with FGCU and the Water Management District. This, uh, these wetlands, they work uh, this way. The water from all the agricultural area comes into the system loaded with nutrients. And so the plants that we have here and the purified mats take up that nutrients. And so the water that is going out from the system and that we deliver down to the Everglades is a much cleaner low in nutrient water. And as I say, this is where we're working at. Uh, what we do uh, is we're going to the field, we uh, jump into our airboats and take some samples. You can see here some of my colleagues taking samples of the purified on, on the vegetation. Uh, here we take samples of water. This is me with some samples of sediment. We collect this sediment course to see the periphyton that is living right there at the top of the sediments. And we take a lot, a lot of different samples, put them in the cooler, and let's, then we go back to the lab to analyze them. And so what we do in the lab is we separate the samples we have here uh, on the left and the top left we have a sample of sediment here you can see a sample of a plant with some periphyton attached that green gooey stuff and with different equipments we see how this periphyton is doing and if they actually can be used as living water filters if they are performing uh in, in a good way so we can use them to clean the water before we can deliver that into the Everglades. And so to sum up a little bit, um, 
these tiny organisms are really much more important than we might think. Uh, we usually don't pay attention to them, but they are the foundation of the system. As I say, they provide food for other organisms. They provide a habitat, a place to live. They are also a source of water when it's the dry season and there's not much water around. They, they are like sponges that absorb that water. And a really important characteristic is that they provide provide us with good water quality. So as I said, they not only provide oxygen to the system that other organisms use to breathe, but they can actually store nutrients and pollutants into their bodies. So what we're trying to do in uh, with our team is to figure out if we can use them as living water filters especially in these STAs, uh, so we can filter that water before sending it to the Everglades. So that water that reaches the Everglades is low in nutrients as it should be. Um, okay, I think that's all I have for you. Uh, maybe I speak a little bit too fast, but if you have any question, we have time to, to get them. Thank you, Xenia. That was so cool. I loved seeing the pictures of, of you with your taking samples. Um, that was awesome. And we have definitely have um, some time for questions. So I see we we just got one. And so one of the questions is number one, great presentation. And it's interesting to think of the slimy mats as important ecosystem filters. What types of tiny organisms are found in the periphyton? Are the same communities seen in nature as in the stormwater treatment areas? Really interesting question, yes. Um, so periphyton is, uh, it, it, you can find like thousands of microorganisms there. We can maybe classify them in big groups as algae, bacteria, fungi. But if we look under the microscope, a little piece of that periphyto mats, we can find thousands of different species. So they're actually pretty, uh, pretty diverse uh, communities. And, and actually in the STAs, uh, we're seeing that the species composition is different than the periphyton that is living naturally in the Everglades because periphyton in the Everglades is adapted to low nutrients. And in the STAs, we actually have a lot of nutrients coming from the fields, um, the agricultural fields. So the species composition is a little bit different. Uh, we, we don't have the same species because of this difference in the amount of nutrients in the water. Interesting. So I have a few more questions. What got you interested in studying microorganisms? Well, actually, uh, at first I wasn't interested at all, to be honest. At the beginning, I was just interested in aquatic plants. Uh, that's what I was studying in Argentina. So when I came here, uh, my advisor presented me this opportunity and we don't have, uh, not that I know of, this kind of uh, periphyton communities in Argentina. So it got me really interested in, in studying a new uh, type of community for me. And once I started working with it, I started getting passionate about it. So. It was more by chance than, than me looking for it. Very cool. So we have another question. Do you put something in your samples before you look at them through the microscope? Uh, no, no, it's not necessary. You should, you should have to, maybe you have to suspend it a little bit on, in water because they are so thick one next to each other that, uh, uh, it's not easy to break up. So sometimes what we do is uh, we grab a like a tube, we put a little bit of 
of filter water, put some piece of that mat, mat there, and we shake it off a little bit so that mat disintegrates, and then we take a drop and put it under the microscope. And another question, how long have you been doing this? Well, working with Perifiron is new to me. I've been doing this since uh, summer last year. Uh, just so, yeah, I'm new to the area too. Uh, so everything's new to me now. <laughs> and why uh, do you put samples in a cooler? Uh, so what we do is first it's easier to transport all the samples that we have. We, we have a lot of different samples from each side. So it's easier to have just one place to put them all. But also we need to keep them at a temperature that they are used to. Uh, so we put in the cooler, we put some water in it so they don't get too hot or too cold. So when we get to the lab, they're still alive. Thank you, makes sense. So we have another question. What is your favorite part about your job? Well, my favorite part is going to a field, uh, being outdoors, uh, yeah, riding the airboats and, and getting into the Everglades. Uh, that's my favorite part, being outdoors. Yeah. Another question someone wants to know, have you ever encountered any reptiles? Uh, I've only seen some alligators and some water snakes, but just passing by, we don't disturb them, they don't look at us. <laughs> Do you look out the whole Everglades or do you just go through part of it? So I guess the question is, do you when you're working in the field, do you go explore the whole Everglades for samples or is there just a specific part you're looking at? No, right now we're just working with the South Florida Water, Water Management District in the uh, STAs. So we're just working on those constructed wetlands. We're not going into the Everglades specifically. And let's see, do periphytons smell? They do. They smell like grass, actually, uh, most of them. Uh, it, yeah, you can maybe you can find them even in the ponds that we have uh, in our communities. Sometimes you can find some floating around or on the uh, on the vegetation and you can grab them. It's, nothing's going to happen to you. And you can see that they're like this spongy uh, structure and they smell, yeah, like grass, I would say. Interesting. What is the best equipment or the most helpful equipment that you use in your job? Um, well, for, for the field, the coolest equipment that we have are those sediment cores that I show you that are like these tubes that we put into uh, the bottom of the wetlands. Those are, are pretty interesting. And then in the lab, uh, we have, of course, the microscopes and we have uh, an equipment called Phytopam, uh, where we can measure the photosynthetic activity of the periphyton and see how well are they performing. Interesting. And let's see, what is the most interesting bacteria if that you have found, if any? Um, well, I don't do much of species analysis that uh, another part of our team do that, uh, but I know there are a lot of cyanobacteria over there, but I, I cannot tell you a specific uh, species of them.
And have you ever had to dive in the water to get your samples? I have actually, yeah. Uh, not diving as scuba diving, but uh, with a snorkel, we have to go underwater to take some samples of the uh, of the roots of the vegetation that was living there. Cool. <laughs> what advice, I'm curious, would you give to students um, who are interested in pursuing a career um, in environmental science? Uh, I would say first, go outdoors, explore your neighborhood, uh, any park or in, even, as I say, the ponds that you have near your house, uh, anything that drives your interest, go try to get yeah, to see what you have around. And, and yes, you have to study, but if, if you have passion for it, um, I mean, it flows pretty easily. I mean, uh, I got interested in environmental science specifically for being outdoors all the time. Awesome. And one other question we have is, what is something that you cannot live without in the field? Even uh, if it's food or water? <laughs> water, yes, yeah, sunscreen. <laughs> um, yeah, I will say I will say that water and sunscreen will save your life here in Florida specifically. <laughs> A couple more questions just came in. Um, what is the coolest reptile that you have found while you were working or that you've seen as you were riding by in, in the airboat? Oh, I think that alligator is gonna be for me. I haven't seen much uh, of those in Argentina, so whenever I encounter one, I, yeah, they're fascinating. And how long do you usually, um, or how long are you usually outside when you're in the field? Well, uh, pretty much all day. We have to go uh, early in the morning, probably around seven. Uh, we out there all day collecting samples and we get back like five in the afternoon, sometimes six. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Xenia, for presenting today. It's so interesting to learn about the microorganisms and how you're studying to see if they can filter our water that goes into the Everglades. Very important work. Um, and thank you for taking the time to answer our students' questions um, and really appreciate you speaking today. No, thank you. Thank you all for listening to me. And if you have any further question, uh, Lisa, you have my uh, my email. Uh, if anyone wants to contact me, I'm available for anything. Thank you so much. And thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. We have a few more of our Water Wednesdays webinars coming up. So please check out the schedule in the chat box. And we hope to see you in the next webinar.